Kevin Feige. Jacob Battalon. Yeah. Laura Harrier. We need a moment for Laura Harrier. How awesome is Jacob in this piece? Yes. Jacob, okay. you crushed it. Okay. You crushed it. I'm crying. All right, Sorry. Laura Harrier, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Give it up for the man, Michael Keaton. Yay! Give it up for the Spider Man, Tom Holland. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the godfather of the Marvel Cinematic Universe himself, Robert Downey Jr. Oh, this is what I mean. This is it. The beautiful, the lovely, the talented, the hottest Aunt May you will ever see, Marissa Tomei. Woo! Yes. Really? Are we doing that? Making a massive debut. Please welcome Zendaya. Gotta love Flash Thompson, Tony Revolori. Woo! That's my boy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of Spider Man Homecoming, John Watts. Watts! Thank you. Cool. All right, well, the first question <clears throat> is really to go to the other side of the panel here. This one is for Amy Pascal and Kevin Feige. Mm -hmm. First question Yay. really is how excited. <laughs> How excited are you to finally bring Spider-Man into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? Uh, it, it was it was one of a one of a handful of well, this will never be possible, but let's dream about it. Moments at Marvel Studios, and then we're sitting in front of all of you nice people in our chairs today, having made the movie, uh, is unbelievable. Yeah, it's incredible. It is incredible. It happened uh, started with a lunch between me and Kevin, and uh, I can't believe we're here now. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> well, listen, uh, John Watts, the biggest challenge for Spider-Man Homecoming was to not only make a fresh standalone Spider-Man movie, but one that does fit in with the MCU, and one that also really does capture a unique tone that is delightful and hilarious. So what were some of the challenges in capturing all those things while staying true to the legacy of Spider-Man? Uh, well, I just try to approach it uh, as the biggest fan possible, and the opportunity to finally put Spider-Man where he belongs uh, in the Marvel Universe really, if anything, just opened up the doors to so many new kinds of stories that we could tell. So if anything, I felt like we were being as true as possible as anyone has ever been able to be about Spider-Man and, uh, and, and how he fits into, into this world. Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Tom Holland. Hey. Yeah. Tom. Tom Holland. Hey. Hey. Listen, Tom Holland. <laughs> Little secret here, Tom. With great power comes great responsibility. It does, yeah, it really does. What kind of <laughs> responsibility do you, did you feel playing a character that just everybody loves? One that means so much to so many people. I think the thing I had to remind myself most when I first took on this character was that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man had such a huge impact on me as a kid. Uh -huh. it was, he was my role model growing up, he was my favorite character, so I had to keep reminding myself that I'm going to have that same impact on kids of the younger generation, so I really wanted to you know, do them proud and to be a solid role model for them and also just make a young, fresh version of a character we know and love so well. Well, I mean, if, you must have had a lot of fun making it because the, the, the fun <laughs> that you project on the screen, it's infectious. Thank you. Well, I just, the question that John, where is John? John and I asked ourselves Hi. is if you gave a 15-year-old superpowers, he would have the time of his life. And when I made this movie, I had the time of my life. <laughs> so it really sort of comes across on screen. You know what else looks like you had the time of your life doing? Sparring with this guy, Robert Downey Jr. The man himself. Yeah. Woo. Woo. In case you didn't know. Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. I remember the beginning of May. <laughs> in the beginning of May in 2008, yes, sir. we were witness to the very first movie in the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the first Iron Man. So that kind of makes you, like I introduced you, the godfather of the MCU. <laughs> right. Now, the question is, it's like, <laughs> how do you feel about the way the MCU has not only evolved, but expanded to now include the likes of Spider-Man? Uh, I think it's, well, well, first of all, 
I'm stoked that they got my memo about the screening room. I wanted it designed like a old Miami Dolphins jersey. <laughs> um, so that worked out. <laughs> you know, but 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 Amy and them had done you know these iterations of Spider-Man previous, and then it's they really should do like one of those breakdown, kind of boring to read, but somewhat important books about really all the miracles that had to happen for us to be sitting here today. And, <laughs> and now I just feel like, hey, you know, we're in like a classy hotel, and like people are clapping, and th this this turned out so well, though. I mean, you know, it really always comes down to, as Kevin says, you got to see the movie and love it. And I saw, I got, I was in it a little bit, <laughs> and and I saw it, and I honestly loved it. And I think that's that's. That's that's what's exciting is they're still really you know working. Yeah. Michael saw Keaton. These folks. Yes. Michael Keaton. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I yeah, that's right. Yes. <laughs> the thing about Toons, about the vulture in this film, is that his motives are plausible. They're grounded. I mean, his family is everything to him, and he will do anything to protect his family. What was what was your impression of when you first were you signed on for this movie? You just saw how grounded and plausible. The motives were compared to like other I thought, villains. I got it. I got it. Yeah. I thought it was. Uh, I thought it was. Uh, in, I'm sorry, but I do know. What I mean, I thought it was inventive uh, and really uh, an interesting way to go. You know, I mean, I'm not. I, I've said this publicly before, so this is not news to I guess anybody. But I'm not really familiar with a lot of the lore. Dig it. So for me, I was trying to catch up. I just thought the simplicity of making this person approachable and, you know, I mean, it's timely. Let's not talk about why it's timely for, for the, you know, because I want to blow my brains out. But it's, it's timely and... Uh, He's only threatening his own life right now. Don't worry about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but I thought um, that was a really unique approach and kind of obvious when you think of it, you know, to make this person someone who's um, approachable and has a legitimate gripe and a legitimate argument. Um, and I, I thought it was really well written, you know, to simplify things. And uh, it was fun, it was a fun gig. Marissa Tomei, yeah. seems like a fun gig for you as well. Like when you look at the comics and the, the other films and you look at the character of Aunt May, I mean, she's, she's very different. <laughs> So when you saw where they were going with the character, like the tone they were trying to capture, the look, like what was your take on, on playing Aunt May as completely different from what we've known for the last like 60 years of the character? Uh, well, I mean, I didn't really know what Aunt May looked like until after I signed up. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't understand why my agents kept going, she's going to be sexy. And I'm like, oh, stop trying to coddle me. Like, what are you, what are you going to pander to me and try to like make me feel, oh, you mean in contrast to another way to go. Um, uh, but uh, but th these guys had the vision of, of how it was going to be revamped and everyone was going to be younger. And she's his aunt by marriage, so she could really be any age at all. Wow. Uh, Jacob. Uh, you, yes. Yes. Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. Hi. Hello. First of all, Hi. listen to this applause here. What does it mean to you to have your character Ned and the, the interplay with Peter be so received by people that it's it really brings a new dynamic to the character? I mean, uh, look, I'm not gonna lie. I I knew this was gonna happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, <laughs> sorry. No, that was awful. Um, no, um, you know, Tom and I, Tom and I really enjoy each other. The main, like, the cast, we like really enjoy each other, and so. You know, it was easy to translate that um, into what you guys saw. And, um, I mean, I love them. I love all of them so much, and it's easy to be around them. And it's easy to make the best things with them. Awesome. Zendaya, you know, to make your, like, such a big film like this, not just a movie, but a movie on this scale, what was that like for you? Um, it was incredible. I mean, I've done, a, like, a lot of things in my little career so far, but this is my first big movie, so I was terrified. <laughs> and I, I suppressed it very well, but, you know, it, it's, it's amazing to be here. And I think all of us uh, still feel like, you know, it's a bit of a dream, you know. And I, I don't know when it's going to feel real, but it definitely doesn't feel real right now. <laughs> and um, I don't mind living in this dream. I think I, I enjoy it here, so I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> when the opening numbers come in, it gets real. Oh, yeah. <laughs> huge. There you go. Laura, Laura what, how much were you aware of the character of Spider-Man? Why do you think that of all the superheroes, that Spider-Man is sort of the one that really does mean the most to the most people? 
Because I think he's the most relatable. Um, we all know what it's like to yeah. grow up and be in high school and go through growing pains and have awkward moments talking to someone you have a crush on. Um, you know, it's it's harder to connect with these superheroes that are completely outside of our world, I think. But um, Spider-Man is first and foremost Peter Parker, who everyone can relate to. You know, I want to ask John, too, that, that you're keeping to the mythology with regards to, like, you know, there's a scene that's right out of Amazing Spider-Man number 33, To Die a Hero. The character of Ned Leeds. You know what happens to Ned Leeds in the comics, right? Yes, I do. All too well. Uh-huh. Okay. No, but so I want that to happen. Like the costume. His costume is it's, it's souped up. It's like an Iron Man costume unto itself. So what were the challenges, John, to, to keep it true to mythology in some ways while evolving things in such a way that it makes it sense for 2017? Well, I got kicked off really nicely by what the Russo brothers did in Civil War. You know, they set up this really great premise that Peter Parker is going to get plucked out of obscurity by Tony Stark, given this really high-tech suit and taken on a crazy adventure, and then just drop back into his regular life without, you know, another thought. So to me, that was just everything that you're saying, like the challenge for me was just like an opportunity. You know, if Tony Stark built a Spider-Man suit, how, like, what could it do? That could be so amazing. There's a little bit of a precedent in the comics with the Iron Spider suit that's get, that gets built. So we use that as sort of the, uh, the inspiration for, you know, all the bells and whistles that Tony would put into this thing. Great. Let's open it up to the audience. I know you all got questions. Let's go right here first. Great. All right. Wait for the mic. Tom, uh, congratulations. Uh, Stephen much. Schaefer, Boston Herald. Uh, this is obviously a life-changing role uh, for you. Can you talk about your experience from the impossible, where everybody sort of first discovered you and you were just astounding and to get to this place, what you've been doing and what you've been looking at with your life? I've been so lucky in my career. I feel like I've been in the right place at the right time at every turn. Um, I've been so lucky that I've got to work with what I, who I would consider to be the best of the best and learn from people and, and every movie has been a very different experience for me and I've been able to play different characters without having to go too far. Now that I'm sort of finding myself a little bit, I'm looking to go a little bit further. Um, but uh, no, I mean, this job, since day one, has been a roller coaster. It's the job that keeps on giving. It has never ceased to amaze me. The fact that I'm here with these guys promoting this movie is insane. And it, like Zendaya said, does not feel real in any way possible. Um, I read a comic yesterday which is based off of my face. I mean, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> so, I, nothing has sunk in. This really feels like I'm about to wake up and be very disappointed. But I'm very happy here, and uh, I can't wait for you guys to see the movie. Hi. Uh, my question is for Robert. So when we interviewed Tom and Jacob last fall, I asked them if they could take anything from the set, what would it be? And okay, okay. Oh, no. oh, no. oh, we all know what Jacob said. Tom said that he would take your Audi, and Jacob said that he would take your watch. How, how do you feel about that? I'm sorry, and which Audi, which watch? <laughs> oh, and Marissa Tomei. And so I'm wondering how, would you, how do you feel about that? I'd take Marissa Tomei. Let's just, this is a print let's interview. Just, okay, just let's just get one. back to the question. And Jacob. What would you take from the set? From the set? Well, I mean... Honestly, you know what? You know why, why I think this really works? There's something about the initial uh, breaking the story and the concept. But whatever the mood board was for this movie, with all those different tones and all the, there was just, it was creatively inspired. I mean, it's really an inspired uh, reinvention of this. And what I would take is that moment where the creatives actually broke this story and said, I think that's it. Because that's ultimately what you wind up, if it's executed correctly, that's what you see on the screen. And that's why I love movies. That's why I'm, I've, you know, I'm a huge fan of movies. And I always wonder, how, how, did they, how did they figure this out to entertain me this well? The mood board. I love her, yeah. The mood board. The mood board. I'm like, his car and his watch. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for so much fun at this film. Uh, my question is for Mr. Keaton and Mr. Downey, and as well as the younger members of the cast. Uh, Mr. Keaton and Mr. Downey are in the top echelon of superhero movies ever. Um, and you've been under a lot of, that comes with media scrutiny and fan love, maybe not so much fan love. Uh, you've kind of been through it all as huge comic book characters. 
what do you think or what words of wisdom would you give to this young cast who is going to have a huge spotlight on them once this movie drops and everyone sees how brilliant it is? And also, for the younger members, did you have a question for Mr. Keaton and Mr. Downey about their experience as superheroes? First of all, I'd like questions. to say, um, why didn't you call me Mr. Keaton? <laughs> 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 just occurred to me. That <laughs> Robert, what do you think? It's a rough call. We were talking about this just before. It's like every every day you wake up, everybody's even. All of this status or experience, it's all kind yeah. of a projection. And I think that if, if and I, I know Michael's like this, and I think, honestly, to me, what really makes the movie work is that scene in... Act three, where you actually realize how high the stakes are with them and the car and the thing, and and, and I think that that was grounded by you know a, a, a master, and um, but I also think it's that thing you just have to you never know. It really just comes down to like, does John like us? Does he think we know what we're doing every time? It doesn't matter. You're like I established this role. Yeah. Now can we try one that works next time? <laughs> what did you just say? Oh, he's right. You know. It's, it's all about having your feet on the ground and realizing that you always you always start at zero mph every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. And in terms of what I'd say, to the, I, I'm, I don't have anything to say. I'm listening to what these people are saying, and it's impressive. Honestly, it is yep. impressive. This is a sounds to me so far. I mean, let's keep our eye on them, but <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so far, like some pretty sane folks. <laughs> <laughs> question for Tony. You know, yeah. your work going from from a, the working with the director like Wes Anderson to John Watts yeah. on a on a one film that's one level in terms of production to another. I don't. What's he whispering to you? <laughs> <laughs> what was it like on, on going to to work on a film that's on such a big scale and with a character that is so beloved around the world? Um, what number did you say again? <laughs> um, no, uh, it's 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 wonderful uh, working with someone like Wes. He's amazing and fantastic. Working with um, uh, on a project like this is is on a different level because you have so many fans and and people who work so hard and put so much effort into it. Um, you can't help but want to uh, do a good job. And you know, I'm very fortunate. Uh, to be a part of it uh, with a great cast. And thank you to John, Amy, and, and Kevin for casting a 5A brown guy to play a 6'2 blonde blue-eyed guy. So, um, yeah, thank you. Right there, you. yes. Hi, um, this one's for Tony. Uh, how does it feel to represent the Latino community in such a well-known comic book franchise? Um, it's wonderful. Um, I think the fact that uh, if, if when you see the film, there's not a single line of exposition as to explain why uh, I look the way I look, and I think that's wonderful that I just am in the movie. It's not about being a certain race. It's not about doing anything, and I think that's the kind of diversity we need in Hollywood now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right in the back. Hi, um, I'm DJ Ben Amin from Fan Bros, and this is kind of a question for the producers and for the cast. There's been a lot of buzzwords about inclusion and diversity lately, and this cast has like like some of the most inclusive and diverse, and just like race change, gender change, characters, everyone has switched. How did you deal with this, and what was the inspiration for this? I would say the inspiration for it was reality. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. A last resort. <laughs> Great question. Come right back up here in the front. Yes. Thanks. Hi. KB from Black Girl Nerds. So I just have a question for Tom and John, actually. What challenges would you like to see Spider-Man overcome in the next installment or even in, you know, Avengers Infinity Wars? I'm still do, getting over the first one. I haven't <laughs> thought about the second one yet. <laughs> uh, honestly, I mean... I really try to think about this stuff just one movie at a time, but I do feel like now that Spider-Man is a part of this big, crazy universe, we can definitely tell some new stories, that's for sure. <laughs> Any tease there? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> right here. Not with Kevin Feige here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hi, so my question is for Tom and Robert. Um, how would you say that Spider-Man's relationship with Tony Stark has evolved since Civil War? I think the relationship between the two of us is more interesting from your point of view because you suddenly have someone to think about other than Tony Stark, you know? He really cares about Peter, and one of the reasons why he doesn't really want Peter to become an Avenger is because he doesn't want the responsibility of something happening to Peter on his conscience. So it's a nice sort of back and forth of me saying, look, I'm powerful enough to be an Avenger, and him saying, but you're not ready to be an Avenger. So it's a, it's a fun back and forth. It's like a big brother, little brother, dad, son type situation. Right back there, yes. Uh, hi, this is for everyone, but the younger cast in particular. This is the first um, teenage Spider-Man we get to see for an entire movie. Um, what do you hope that uh, ordinary teen teenagers take away from his experience in the film and, and all the characters' experience in the film who aren't superheroes? But what, what do you hope they take? A, what lesson do they learn from watching this teen superhero? Okay. <laughs> um, we Jacob, just... <laughs> what's your message for the teens? Um, oh, no. uh, yeah. yeah. We, I mean, our message is that you don't have to be the jock and you don't have to be the cool person in high school to be yourself. You know, it's the coolest person, the coolest version of yourself is yourself. And uh, we're like nerds and we love to be smart and that's okay. And um, there's nothing wrong with being yourself. Yeah, you don't have to apologize for who you are, right? Is this on? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think we've been talking about a lot, a lot just, um, you know, everyone in this movie is kind of so different, but genuinely kind of themselves, like especially, you know, Zendaya's character who is <laughs> very different but not ashamed of it. Same with Liz and Ned and Flash, everybody. Um, I think if teenagers can take that away, it would be great. I have a question for, for you. Now, like, Zendaya, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Zendaya. The Breakfast Club. <laughs> <laughs> the Breakfast Club. Uh, Ali Sheedy. Yeah. How much were you inspired De definitely inspiration there. I mean, I remember, because I didn't really know what kind of character I was playing until I showed up, because everything's kind of <laughs> top secret, you know what I'm saying? So I read the script, and I was like, okay, she's interesting. All right, this is going to be fun. And then I met with John, and he had so many different like references, and, and that was definitely one of them. And just kind of making that distinct character, making somebody that I think was different, and embracing the weird, kind of like we've been talking about, like young people. It's, it's okay to be weird. That is okay, and it's okay to be exactly who you are. And if you make things awkward and uncomfortable, as long as you you cool, you know what I mean? That's <laughs> the most important thing, you know? So I, I, I love that she's outspoken. I love that she says what everybody's thinking, but she just doesn't care. You know, so I think that a lot of young people should have that a little bit more. So it was, it was, it was fun playing that dry, you know, kind of version of myself, really. <laughs> so. Who's got the mic? Here, I believe. Yes, you. Go okay. Ahead. Jordan Calhoun, Black Nerd Problems. Uh, we talked a lot about the tone of the film. Yeah, check it out. Uh, we talked a lot about the tone of the film and how it's an hilarious, uh, hilarious oh, no. comedy. So I was interested, which one of you guys was uh, the biggest clown offset? And also, second question for Robert Downey Jr. Um, how does it feel portraying Tony Stark as the connective tissue across so many different Marvel films? We've seen Tony's evolution through a lot of different films. So how does it feel being the, the, the mutual thread through a lot of the, the, the universe? OK, I already forgot the first question, because I'm the Biggest clown. Biggest clown. What was the clown. first question for them? Jacob. Oh, who's clown? Wait, wait. Jacob. Was Definitely clown. Jacob. I would say Jacob. OK, I don't think this is a good interview right now. Um. <laughs> the amazing thing about Jacob is he rapped on the movie. He finished filming. We didn't. He was done with his part of the film, and he just <laughs> moved in with me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, Jacob, okay, okay. go home. And okay, he lived okay, with wait, me wait, and wait, my wait, best mate for like wait, wait. six weeks. You're talking to work every okay. day. Again, you're, you're, talking as, you're talking That's as support. if you didn't want me there. You yeah. obviously oh, wanted me. we did want that. you there for sure. <laughs> when did you guys realize that you were best friends? Yeah. <laughs> and then we fell in love. Yeah. <laughs> it's been great ever since. Don't worry about it. Uh, connective tissue, yeah. Tying it all, bringing it all together. What happens is things are presented to me that are really well thought out by folks who have, have been doing this correctly for a long time. And I kind of, I just like, I go like, check, you know and then attempt to take the credit in press conferences. So, <laughs> I'm holding this whole thing together. It's <laughs> obvious. Hi, Black Root Problems. Check it out. Dude, you just made my day. Hi, this question is for Tom. Hi. Hi. 
I understand you have a dance and an acrobatic background. So can you talk about that and then how that played into doing your stunts and what, how did you master hanging upside down? Yeah, you can't really master hanging upside down. That's not something I've been prepared for. Uh, but uh, yeah, my dancing and gymnastics background was so helpful to this project because we were able to do things as Peter Parker that they probably hadn't been able to do in the past. Um, but that said, sometimes they would o like overestimate my skill set. John would be like, can you just backflip off that wall and land on that beam? I'm like, no, John, I can't do that. I'm not that good, dude. It's hard to, you, know, you forget that you're not actually Spider-Man. So yeah. <laughs> Just, like, just climb, climb up, up the up wall. wall. I'm like, I can't do that, John. <laughs> Let's do it. Got a question back here. Hey, guys. Brandon Davis, uh, comicbook.com. Uh, Robert, you've been with the MCU since its earliest days. Uh, we have Tom coming in at 20 years old. Wondering, does this at all feel like maybe like a passing of the torch for Spider-Man to maybe be what we just talked about with Tony being the connective tissue, or do you want to stick around forever? Oh, whatever. I, I've been semi-retired since, again, the first weekend that uh, Iron yeah. Man 1 opened. Um, <laughs> I, you, you never... It's the, the great thing about life is it is so much... Think Good things happen, and if, I'll speak for myself. You get inflated, and then you think, oh, my God, I've created everything that's, that's going my way. <laughs> and then things happen where you go, all right, there's a little evidence to the contrary. And at this point, you go back to, you just like, I'm, you know, I'm, it's nice to be on this call sheet. Um, but uh, so as you can see, I've changed dramatically, and I'm an extremely humble individual. <laughs> right here? In the red? Oh, yeah. hi, good morning. Um, Marta for Della's Jubilation, a blogger, not a real reporter. Thanks for the, clarifying that. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, my question is actually for the producers. As a uh, long-time Queens resident, I was wondering if it's possible in the next installments to get some, I don't know, real action in Queens maybe this time around, like actual Queens? With uh, we'd love to. John? <laughs> okay. Sure. <laughs> See how simple? John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Like whereabouts specifically? Um, do you like apartment two? <laughs> Sunnyside? You know, like Corona, Flushing Meadow Park. Okay. I mean, last time that globe got, you know, blown up was by yeah, yeah. Will Smith in Black, you know, Men in Black, right? So no, if you actually, that's, that's where the Star Expo Man is in Iron Man 2, remember? Right. So, <laughs> you know, like yeah, I we said, shot a few Reese, Park, <laughs> Reese Park is great. This is starting to feel like a game show. <laughs> Reese Park is great. You know, there's All a couple right. Queen, uh, Q Gardens. And the court steps are awesome, so maybe look into that for next time as around. As much Queens as possible, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Right in terms of getting action in Queens, I think, Robert, you and I have gotten some action in Queens. <laughs> <laughs> I think. 2001, I think. Yeah, we kept it flat there for a while. <laughs> Dirty deeds done dirt cheap. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Oh. Is, what role models? I don't know. What, I, yeah. Any so other terrible. messages I for the teens? The <laughs> so, so my question is for Mr. Keaton. Um, Michael, you've played the biggest of heroes, and you've now played the don't biggest of supervillains. <laughs> so and now, and now I'm sorry. I played you've the played the biggest of superheroes, yes, yes. and now you've played the biggest of supervillains. Yes. Which did you prefer? Oh. Oh. Um, they're both fun. Um, I think Actors tend to, you know, be drawn toward uh, not necessarily villainous. Well, yeah, probably probably villainous characters. I mean, it's cliched, but it kind of tends to be often true that you know when you want to delve into the dark side, it just gets interesting. That's all. Usually because they, you know, the, um, the reality is the lead or hero uh, sometimes by its very the nature of the piece has to be not one dimensional but it has to represent a thing very strongly whereas the supporting actors or character actors often are they're more dimensional for if, you know without going into this and doing some sort of bullshit actor talk um, <laughs> but it tends to be true and you know um, a lot of times um, I would think everyone or most of us who had an experience where you're playing one role and you're looking at some of those minor roles and you're thinking, oh man, I'd like to have a bite of that. You know, because <laughs> it's, it's just so much fun. And I've been fortunate. I've been, you know, able to play a lot of different things, little tiny parts and 
uh, big parts. Um, they're both fun. They're both different. You know, you t it's more iconic, and you make a hell of a lot more dough <laughs> being, <laughs> and being, and being the big lead guy. But, you know, they're both fun. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our press conference for Spider-Man Homecoming. The movie opens July 7th. Let's hear it. Everybody? <laughs> Reminder, please stay seated while... Wait a minute. You guys aren't the real Avengers. I can tell. Hulk gives it away. So what did you think of that Spidey video? Did you like it? Now, keeping with the Spider-Man vibe, I've got some interesting facts from the film that might be of interest to you. Did you know every live action Spider-Man movie released after 2010 has opened 10 years after all three San Raimi, Tobey Maguire movies? The Amazing Spider-Man from 2012 was released 10 years after 2002 Spider-Man. The Amazing Spider-Man 2 from 2014 was released 10 years after Spider-Man 2, which launched in 2005, and Spider-Man Homecoming will be released 10 years after 2007 Spider-Man 3. Hmm, interesting, no? Did you also know that Tom Holland is the youngest actor at 19 to be cast as Peter Parker? His predecessors, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield, were 25 and 26 respectively when they were cast. Now, as always, let me know in the comments below your thoughts on the movie and remember to subscribe and ring the notification bell to always receive the latest trailers the moment they are online. And I'll see you next time.